Hey folks, Sammy here. Some interesting Overwatch history, current news, and perhaps a few hints as to the future direction of some things in the game for you today. Yesterday, Jeff Kaplan, game director of Overwatch, in case you're not familiar with him, took to the Overwatch subreddit to answer questions from the community in an impromptu Q&A or AMA. Ask me anything. Overwatch's past, present and future were discussed, relics and remnants and things that came from Project Titan, how heroes used to be, how the team view balance of the game and some of their feelings around that and the community on the PTR at the moment, as well as hints to the future as well. I've gone through the answers line by line here and rounded them up in different sections and themes for you so you can navigate it easily. Time codes are in the description below if you want to skip between. Broadly speaking, we've got news, Overwatch history and facts from the past, Overwatch now about the PTR, hero balancing philosophy, and a lot about generally how the developers appear to approach Overwatch development, which I find really interesting. A little bit about Overwatch's future and perhaps what we could see coming from what the developers think about certain things. First things first, news on Arisa's launch date. Now she has been confirmed to be releasing on the 21st of March, that's next Tuesday, the PTR update time for Overwatch. There's also a quite funky little behind the scenes, behind the hero development of Arisa video. You can check that out on the Play of Watch Twitter or on their YouTube channel. So looking forward to Arisa next week. It's gonna be an interesting time for Overwatch. Another anchor tank added to the roster. Can't wait to see what the actual effects on competitive are going to be. Okay, on with the Jeff news. Okay, firstly, news and gameplay. Well, there might be, and I stress might, some Lucio changes coming. In a wider piece about how heroes are balanced and how many changes that the developers try internally don't even make it to PTR or being talked about, Jeff did mention that they were playing around at the moment with Lucio even before PTR stage. He said that at the moment Lucio to many people feels like a must have but doesn't feel impactful, and I found that an interesting word, to play. They want to try and make Lucio somehow more engaging to play and a little bit less of a must pick. So these changes may never even make it to the PTR and we may get no more details than that. But the very fact that they've been mentioned shows I think that the team are seriously considering the prospect but we'll have to wait and see. I remember the days when Lucio was a little bit of a damage dealing monster as well in the early days of Overwatch and the beta. However at the moment most people generally tend to use him or he's pretty much a must pick at higher levels of play due to his speed boost ability. Then the speed aura seems to be the thing that they might take a tweak to either by maybe changing that perhaps or somehow at some point in the future introducing another speed buff to another character for example. The other thing I think is that well they talk about Lucio being passive. Now sure, you're all about auras. It's primarily about positioning and sometimes running around DPS stanking your way to staying out the way. How can you make Lucio a little bit more engaging? Well, you're either retuning some of his abilities or you're giving him sort of more damage or something when it comes to his primary weapon. I don't know, we'll have to wait and see, but interesting to see that Lucio changes might be inbound. Next up, a bit of news about competitive rewards and more the philosophy behind them. Loads of people have asked if there are other things that could be added to spend your hard earned competitive points on. Now, it was interesting to see Mr. Kaplan's response on this. He said that they are looking at it, but the team are a bit torn and explained the reason why. If you put more rewards in, that's gonna encourage people to play comp just for rewards. One philosophy is that Competitive should be there as a mode because people want to compete and enjoy the competitive framework of playing, not just playing it to get rewards. Now, more attractive rewards you put into a competitive system, the more and more people you'll get playing who maybe have more of a focus on the rewards rather than the competitive experience and playing for that laddering up before to get better and similar. Attracting people to the system or too many people to the system in that way could create gameplay challenges, maybe differences in mentality and outlook. The development team have said many times that they love Junkenstein's revenge and the reception that got from the community and they would like to make more. So I would always be hopeful at seeing more PvE style brawls coming in in future. The other interesting thing was that Jeff actually answered a question specifically on the Summer Games. He said that they put a ton of time into the Summer Games and they would like to bring it back at some point and they would love to give people another chance to get those skins. Now for those of you worrying that when these season events have gone, you might not get the skins in future. That's a hopeful thing. I would very much hope, for example, that next Halloween we might see a chance to get Witch Mercy and all of that kind of stuff again. So I wouldn't worry too much at this point about Blizzard exclusively locking out skins for the future. That's something that they seem to be keeping in mind and hopefully it's not going to happen. Okay, next up, there was a whole bunch of interesting stuff on Overwatch's history, including development stories, the origins from Titan, and a few fascinating facts along the way. Firstly, Jeff talked a bit about background of Titan classes and inspirations for various characters. When one community member asked about Tracer specifically, he mentioned that Tracer actually was born from the Jumper class in Titan. Because Titan was a class-based shooter and MMO type hybrid, a lot of these kind of classes were more sort of avatars, like the Warrior, like the Warlock, rather than being a male or female character or hero. And apparently most concepts of jumper to start with were actually male. Blink, Recall and Pulse Bomb were all jumper abilities, including the characteristic 
ballistic tracer now dual wielding machine pistols and Jeff actually mentioned that at the time he was playing a lot of Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2 using the M16 as his primary and those sweet sweet or if you played MWT like I did slightly annoying Glock 18s as the secondary. <laughs> the jumpers were Jeff's Glock 18s. Because Titan was an MMO as well, the jumper also got a lot of progression abilities. A level up system, apparently the jumper at one point had shotguns, knockbacks, and in Jeff's words he said that this made the design of the character somewhat cluttered and confused. When the team started looking at Overwatch and looking at things from Titan, Overwatch was simplified back down from this. So they took the abilities that worked well together and then created a hero rather than a class. So Tracer with a personality and origin and took the sort of slightly confused mechanics and it sounds to be nice maybe this was a trend in various titan classes maybe it wasn't but by distilling it down to something simple and making it hero based jeff said that it made her work tracer work above the mechanics of the actual jumper class. Reaper was apparently Reaper, now we don't know whether that was a class or not, but apparently he had a crossbow at one point in Titan, pretty cool. Widowmaker evolved from a class called the Ranger, as did Bastion and Soldier 76, so maybe if you look at a Ranger with sort of rifles and ranged abilities, if all three of these evolved from a class called the Ranger, then it's interesting to try and look at Widow, Bastion and Soldier 76 and try and work out what in their hero designs is their sort of shared DNA. Symmetra and Torbjorn were both from the Architect class, well that makes perfect sense, kind of like a Builder class I suppose. Pose. and Reinhardt was from the Juggernaut class, although apparently he's very very different from what Juggernauts stereotypically were, only the big guy with a shield bit actually stuck. Genji and Hanzo evolved, unsurprisingly perhaps from an assassin based class. For those of you who didn't know, Genji and Hanzo were originally sort of one hero concept in Overwatch as well, before they were split out into two separate individuals with their distinct sword based and bow based kit. Jeff also mentioned in another question that the hero who had the most changes was Bastion. There was kind of a thing within the development team that he had an alt of the week mentality. I do remember way, way back when Overwatch was announced that Bastion was talked about as having a remote mine and all kinds of things. Apparently he could also shoot through wards. He had an artillery volley that he could unleash at some point or another. And they had a lot of challenges trying to get an alt that stuck until they came up with configuration tank. So for those of you who don't like Bastion right now, imagine a Bastion who can shoot through walls or call down an artillery strike on the map. Another cool thing that was mentioned with regards to reference to Project Titan was how cool some of the concept art was. And Jeff specifically referenced Numbani. There's some really cool concept art out there from Peter Lee. I'm putting up a piece here now. And Jeff said that Numbani was actually a direct thing from Titan. Peter Lee did some really cool art of what a futuristic African city could look like. And Numbani and its look is very much a piece of that Titan heritage. Finally, there was quite an interesting comment as to Overwatch's development on consoles. Now, interestingly, Jeff mentioned that the game was designed to be on console from the start. Although they didn't have a signed contract with Sony or Microsoft until just before BlizzCon 2015, when they announced they'd be on consoles, they'd actually been working on a console version since 2013. Now, in terms of what Jeff mentioned about the maybe specific challenges, he said that it wasn't actually a massive challenge for the team to be developing for multiple platforms at the same time. But what he found it hardest to adapt to was the inability to release stuff or change stuff as frequently as he could on World of Warcraft. So obviously this has been mentioned before by the team with regards to the PTR, console patches and similar. Remember of course, the PC version and the whole Battle.net platform is Blizzard owned and managed so they can pretty much update their own stuff through their own pipeline. In terms of Sony and Microsoft, Blizzard of course have to work and wait with a certification process. They send changes to Sony and Microsoft to have to check them out to a degree to make sure that they're not going to do anything to break, cause problems on the platform before putting it live. So there's an inherent time delay factor there. That actually makes the fact that several of the big content patches like New Heroes and things go out pretty much simultaneously on PC and console, pretty impressive. The delay time is not too big. Okay, next up, I've grouped these pieces together in terms of Overwatch's present and sort of attitudes to development and how the game may change and how it's balanced by the team. And then also a few things about its future as well. In terms of where Overwatch could be in a few years, Jeff mentioned a crawl, walk, run development philosophy from Mike Mahame, the CEO. And at the moment, the team see Overwatch as being in this crawl phase. The team have apparently so much more they want to do beyond the existing game. And I love this part. They really do want to create a Blizzard universe that's worthy of being alongside Warcraft, Starcraft, and Diablo. Now in various lore videos, when I've talked about the sort of lore journey and people's impatience, just like mine, or keenness for story and for more lore. When you see that kind of statement, it's showing that there's a long-term plan or the goal of a long-term plan. Now remember that Warcraft, Starcraft and Diablo, some of these are 15-year-old franchises, 15-year-old brands, worlds, stories, games with different versions as well, which we'll come on to. Remember, of course, Warcraft was a real-time strategy game before it became an MMO. Starcraft was obviously a real-time strategy game and in the past, Blizzard were looking at doing a Starcraft FPS in Starcraft Ghost before that was sadly canceled. That'll be interesting for us to talk about later on another one of Jeff's comments. 
However, the fact that Blizzard want to have a long-term plan for Overwatch makes me really, really optimistic for both story and, who knows, maybe different flavours of Overwatch in the future. So we have to remember, of course, as I love saying in lore videos, that Overwatch is only going to be one in terms of how long it's been released for in May. Hopefully there are many, many years and, who knows, maybe even a decade to come. I'd really love that. There was an interesting question from the community about more heroes, and Jeff actually mentioned that the more that they get into the development of this incarnation of Overwatch, I'll come back to that in a second, they're of the opinion that too many heroes too fast will actually hurt the game. Jeff then called out that the business model of Overwatch does not demand constant hero releases, e.g. not a MOBA-centric one, and he wants to avoid homogenizing or undoing heroes by releasing new ones all the time. So I think that's the challenge of between keeping the game fresh and not hurting existing game mechanics. So what does this all mean? I thought there were a few interesting things in here. First things first, that call of this incarnation. Now obviously there's probably nothing confirmed right now, but hopefully there would be in future other incarnations of Overwatch. As I said, StarCraft was an RTS, and then they tried to move it to being a first person shooter. But let's see what that looks like in future. I think it's just another thing along with the plan for Overwatch to be a long-term game that can stand up to Warcraft, Starcraft and Diablo universes. That universe building is something that I'd love to see more of in future, whether it's a Overwatch game in a different medium or not. The points on the hero philosophy are interesting, particularly if you play things like League of Legends, Heroes of the Storm or Smite. A lot of people say Overwatch doesn't release enough heroes or hasn't released enough heroes yet. This content release is too slow. What I just step back and have a think about personally is that Overwatch isn't a MOBA. It's not League of Legends or Heroes of the Storm or Smite, where new heroes really frequently in a huge hero roster, part of what drives the game forward and from a financial perspective, keeps people spending money to support the game, however they're paid for. However, people do have more expectations, I think, in a good way on Overwatch than a traditional first-person shooter release. For example, a Call of Duty or something, which is, you know, boxed once a year every November. It has a little story mode and then three or four DLC releases that you've got to pay for or you've got to pay a season pass for. Overwatch sits in the middle of those two, both in terms of what kind of game it is, but also I'd say our perceptions based on other games that we play and the frequency of content for those games and how we pay for it as to where it should be. Too many heroes, I would say, from a personal perspective, can make games a bit too complex and increase the learning curve, most importantly, quite a lot. So how easy is it for a new player of a game to get into understanding a game, playing it at a reasonable level of understanding and learning the basics before they can skill up at a hero or heroes or a class and get themselves to get on? I think of Dota for this. I've played a lot of core MOBAs and things like that, but I just cannot get into Dota because I don't think I can invest the time into getting through that initial skill curve through that initial learning curve. Make that learning curve too long and you're making it harder for new people to get into your game. And of course, new people coming into your game is important for your game to be existing and healthy for a long period of time. Also, the more heroes that you make in any of these games, you do get heroes that are too similar to each other, sometimes too fast. That's a design challenge as well. So I can understand what Jeff is saying here about being careful about re releasing too many heroes and that they want to release them on a basis that means that it changes up the gameplay and also keeps the story, the world fresh and things like that. If I was to draw something from that, it's probably nothing that we don't know already, but I would say don't expect Overwatch to ever have the amount of heroes that say, for example, League of Legends or anything has. They are different games and they're working in different ways, as well as the business model, but also the kind of gaming community that they are. There are a bunch of interesting things on hero balance philosophy. Jeff has mentioned this before, particularly with regards to a big forum post on Bastion and his opinions. And I think there are a few consistent messages coming out from the dev team at the moment on how we as a community should react to and interpret balance changes, and also how we should try and use the public test realm, or PTR, for those of you who can get on PC and play it. It's been mentioned in the Bastion notes that Jeff mentioned on the forums before, and other things, that the perception of players pick and what is prevalent and what is not doesn't often match individual player behavior. Jeff also mentioned this when talking about sharing stats in the AMA. He said that not everyone can look at them objectively and there will always be, for example, a most picked hero and a least picked hero. That's just the way that things work, but it doesn't mean that the game or the heroes are either broken or over or underpowered. Although Blizzard stats aren't quite where they'd like to be and they're trying to improve them, they'd love to give more detail to other sites like Master Overwatch, Overbuff and similar. They do feel that those sites perhaps only represent the core or top players and sometimes when there are meta reports and things that deal with the pro scene or the top core of players, the rest of the player base take them as gospel when in actual fact they don't reflect the wider play rate. Jeff did give an example in the Bastion patch notes for example and his discussion about those on the forums about Mercy. He said that although Mercy was perceived to be weak at a particular time in the meta, the Blizzard stats actually showed that she was the third most played hero across all modes, not just competitive or quick play or anything like that. So for example Mercy, even when she's been conceived as being underpowered, 
is actually a very, very played hero and perhaps not in as weak a spot or not as unpopular as the community at large would believe from looking at pro meta reports. In terms of stats, there was also a bit of interesting insight about Overwatch's or Blizzard's business intelligence team. They also work with the design team to look at heroes, maps, matchmaking, progression items, queue times, game mode popularity, and generally passing all the data that the team get. For example, Blizzard tried to keep maps balanced as closely as possible to a 50-50 win rate. Eichenwald has never achieved this 50-50, and amongst other things and player feedback, that's one reason why Blizzard made changes. Blizzard have made changes to the main door already of the castle. They apparently also have one more round of changes coming to the first choke point. So interestingly, I think that's going to be widened up or something like that. There was also an interesting point on public test realm mentality and how we as a community react to and should respond to perhaps any kind of change. Jeff said that the team tried to balance heroes on three feelings, both what the players are feeding back, stats, and the team's own feelings as players themselves. He did say it's very rare that all three align. Again, according to stats, Symmetra and Bastion were fine in terms of the amount that they were played and how they were being used. But although the stats might have said that they were being played and used quite a lot, both players and the actual Overwatch team felt that they felt underwhelming, hence the changes recently to Bastion and Symmetra. There are also many big changes that Blizzard try out internally that never even see the light of day and never even get discussed, even in a theoretical example, by developers on the forums or in other places. Jeff's PTR comments on the past, he's also reiterated them in this AMA, and I think it's kind of important for us to keep an eye on and to pay a bit of attention to. I'm slightly worried, don't want to lose the PTR. And as silly as that sounds, some of the comments that have come out recently have sounded a little bit down on the PTR and how the community react to them. So it's worth looking at this and then seeing maybe how we can try and take some of this on board. So here's Jeff's thoughts on the PTR. People go on for around average of 16 minutes playtime. They try a new or changed hero and they log out. They don't play traditional compositions. They might not, for example, play quick play with one hero limit. If they don't get the new hero or the hero that's been changed, they'll leave the match. And some people who have less than 20 minutes playtime on a hero test that hero on a PTR and then go publicly and give their feedback based off one match. Jeff then said, well, if the team make changes that go live on the PTR and then go live, they get heat. If they make big changes and pull them back, they also get heat. And he said that at this stage, they kind of just have to try trust their own instincts and own up for their own mistakes. Although I completely understand all of that and I'll put my hands up. I've occasionally jumped onto the PTR, done exactly some of those things and made a snap judgment on a hero. I think we really need to be slightly careful as a community as to how we treat the PTR in the future and how we react to changes, be they perceived nerfs, perceived buffs and similar things like that. Uh, this is content creators and players and absolutely all of us really. If we're going on the PTR and it's good for people to get on the PTR, try and play these heroes and changes in lots of different ways to give Blizzard as much data as possible. That helps them out and it also helps us form a better opinion of how these changes are coming through. Say for example if these Lucio changes go through, I think we need to give them the best shot we can, play them a lot on the PTR in a different set of ways and me as a player, I don't want Blizzard sounding as though they're feeling low about the PTR and how the players react to everything. I think we probably need to try and be a little bit more supportive and perhaps a little bit less critical. And I'll put my hand up, I can definitely do a better job of that. Jeff did say, however, that there's an internal competitive playtest group of Diamond Plus players who try these in more competitive scenarios, and sometimes pro players also invite the Blizzard team to watch scrims on the PTR as well. So there are lots of different viewpoints. In summary, we don't want Blizzard getting down about the experience of giving us stuff on the PTR to try out. We don't want that to stop. And if we can't give feedback and react to changes in a way that support Blizzard in making better decisions, then they could just say that they trust their own instincts and take the PTR and us out of the loop entirely. I think that's very unlikely, but we don't want to risk it happening. And certainly we can all help more sculpt and formulate these changes by playing on the PTR if we can get on PC and make it possible, and by giving changes time to shake out. My personal opinion on this, for example, when Bastion went live for a while with his massive new changes, with the changes to his self-repair, his barrier busting and similar, as well as the quicker time in and out of Sentry. Everyone for a short period of time when they played with him felt that he was pretty painful. And he was in some ways, as Jeff kind of said in his forum post. However, look at the Bastion changes in context. The changes came to Bastion, Arisa was then launched as a hero and on the PTR with a new barrier, and then Blizzard come out and make these changes to Zenyatta with the Orb of Discord and talk about their concern or eye on barriers and barrier creep. They didn't want barriers to become too overwhelming or dominant, Reinhardt's barrier, for example. If we then look back at the Bastion changes, having seen Orisa and those Zenyatta changes that then got wound back on the PTR, we could see that if you look at that holistically, 
Blizzard was looking how to deal with the question of barriers whilst introducing new heroes and making other heroes feel better. Trying to make Bastion feel better, trying to make sure that Orisa and Reinhardt's barriers when Orisa was launched as a hero don't become too overwhelming or stifling. We could only see a part of that at a time. We saw the Bastion part of the picture and got concerned. Orisa then came out and it made a little bit more sense. And then we saw the changes to Zenyatta and similar, as well as tweaks to Arna. And that gave us a huge picture of Blizzard trying to do a lot of different balancing and tweaking to the feel of the game around barriers and the new hero. As a result, if we can't see the whole picture quite a lot of the time, sometimes we just need to be a little bit more patient, I think. What do you reckon? Finally, Jeff shared a couple of fun facts and a few opinions. He doesn't like it when people say X hero needs an overhaul when they really mean that the hero needs a balanced tweak. And big hates of his are toxic behavior or hyperbole. <laughs> Welcome to YouTube, Jeff, on the latter, I think. He also mentioned there's no magic way of solving toxicity. People look to Blizzard to sort it out, but he makes the fair point that no online game has ever solved this question so far and said that anonymity does weird things to humanity and he's worried for the zombie apocalypse. <laughs> Finally, a little fun fact, Jeff plays and he's platinum. He plays at apparently 25 to 50 games of comp before going back to quick player arcade every season. He plays around 2700. So I've got a bit of work to do to get to Jeff levels of play. Finally, he does get recognized on voice comms more so now than he used to. Uh, he occasionally has to pretend that he's not Jeff if he just wants to play a game and actually said that uh, it's a bit of a shame sometimes if he does get recognized because he's a big communicator and he likes shop calling and things like that. Now, because he used to be a raid leader, I guild leader in EverQuest doing a lot of very, very hardcore raiding content. I can totally see that happening. There you go. There's a bit of a summary of everything in the Q&A. Again, this was a bit of a long video. I hope you stuck through it. And if you did get to this stage of things, do let me know what the best Pokemon in the world, in your opinion, is in the comments below. What do you think of all those thoughts? Do you think that maybe we as a community could be a bit more positive or perhaps a bit more patient when it comes to around balance changes and hero changes? What do you think about the future of Overwatch and the things that were perhaps mentioned there? Is the rate of heroes that currently come out pretty good for you? Or do you think Overwatch should release more or less heroes, for example? I'd love to know your thoughts in the comments. Cheers for tuning into this Overwatch news and a bit of a deeper dig and dive into all of the different things that happened in this AMA. If you like Overwatch lore, if you like Overwatch story, and you're interested in finding out about more of those, do check my playlist below. If you like this video, do throw a like, subscribe, comment, let me know what you think. Cheers for tuning in. I've been Hammy. Take it easy.